Disc 7 Poirot glanced in both directions. The deck was empty. He then sprinted towards the stern. As he rounded the corner, he ran into Tim Allerton, who was coming full tilt from the opposite direction. "'But what the devil was that?' cried Tim breathlessly. Poirot said sharply, "'Did you meet anyone on your way here?' "'Meet anyone? No! Then come with me!' He took the young man by the arm and retraced his steps. A little crowd had assembled by now. Rosalie, Jacqueline and Cornelia had rushed out of their cabins. More people were coming along the deck from the saloon. Ferguson, Jim Fanthorpe and Mrs. Allerton. Race stood by the revolver. Poirot turned his head and said sharply to Tim Allerton, "'Got any gloves in your pocket?' Tim fumbled. Uh, uh, "'Yes, I have.' Poirot seized them from him, put them on and bent to examine the revolver. Race did the same. The others watched breathlessly. Race said, "'He didn't go the other way. Fanthorpe and Ferguson were sitting on this deck lounge. They'd have seen him.' Poirot responded, "'And Mr. Allerton would have met him if he'd gone aft?' Race said, pointing to the revolver, "'Rather fancy we've seen this not so very long ago. Must make sure, though.' He knocked on the door of Pennington's cabin. There was no answer. The cabin was empty. Race strode to the right-hand drawer of the chest and jerked it open. The revolver was gone. Well, settles that, said Race. Now then, where's Pennington himself? They went out again on deck. Mrs. Allerton had joined the group. Poirot moved swiftly over to her. Madame, take Miss Otterborn with you and look after her. Her mother has been... He consulted Race with an eye, and Race nodded. Killed. Dr. Bessner came bustling along. Caught in Himmel! What is there now? They made way for him. Race indicated the cabin. Bessner went inside. Find Pennington, said Race. Any fingerprints on that revolver? No, none, said Poirot. They found Pennington on the deck below. He was sitting in the little drawing room, writing letters. He lifted a handsome, clean-shaven face. Anything new? he asked. Didn't you hear a shot? Why, now, now you mention it, I, I believe I did hear a kind of a bang, but I, I never dreamed. But who's been shot? Mrs. Otterborn. Mrs. Otterborn? Pennington sounded quite astounded. Well, you do surprise me. Mrs. Otterborn. He shook his head. I can't see that at all. He lowered his voice. Well, strikes me, gentlemen, we've got a homicidal maniac aboard. We ought to organize a defense system. Mr. Pennington, said Race, how long have you been in this room? Why, well, let me see, Mr. Pennington gently rubbed his chin. I should say a matter of twenty minutes or so. And you haven't left it? Why, no, certainly not. He looked inquiringly at the two men. You see, Mr. Pennington, said Race, Mrs. Otterborn was shot with your revolver. Chapter 25 Mr. Pennington was shocked. Mr. Pennington could hardly believe it. Why, gentlemen, he said, this is a very serious matter. Very serious indeed. Extremely serious for you, Mr. Pennington. For me? Pennington's eyebrows rose in startled surprise. But, my dear sir, I was sitting quietly riding in here when that shot was fired. You have perhaps a witness to prove that? Pennington shook his head. Why, no, I wouldn't say that, but it's clearly impossible that I should have gone on to the deck above, shot this poor woman, and, well, why should I shoot her anyway, and come down again with no one seeing me? There are always plenty of people on the deck lounge this time of day. How do you account for your pistol being used? Well, I am afraid I may be to blame there. Quite soon after getting aboard, there was a conversation in the saloon one evening, I remember, about firearms, and I mentioned then that I always carried a revolver with me when I travel. Who was there? Well, I can't remember exactly. Most people, I think. Quite a crowd, anyway. He shook his head gently. Why, yes, he said. I am certainly to blame there. He went on. First Lynette, then Lynette's maid, and now Mrs. Otterborn. 
there seems no reason in it all. But there was reason, said Race. There was? Yes. Mrs. Otterbourne was on the point of telling us that she had seen a certain person go into Louise's cabin. Before she could name that person, she was shot dead. Andrew Pennington passed a fine silk handkerchief over his brow. All this is terrible, he murmured. Poirot said, Monsieur Pennington, I would like to discuss certain aspects of the case with you. Will you come to my cabin in half an hour's time? I, I should be delighted. Pennington did not sound delighted. He did not look delighted either. Race and Poirot exchanged glances and then abruptly left the room. Cunning old devil, said Race. But he's afraid, eh? Poirot nodded. Yes, he is not happier, Mr. Pennington. As they reached the promenade deck again, Mrs. Allerton came out of her cabin, and seeing Poirot beckoned him imperiously. Madame? That poor child! Tell me, Monsieur Poirot, is there a double cabin somewhere that I could share with her? She oughtn't to go back to the one shared with her mother, and mine is only a single one. Oh, that can be arranged, madame. It is very good of you. But it's mere decency. Besides, I'm very fond of the girl. I've always liked her. Is she very upset? Terribly. She seems to have been absolutely devoted to that odious woman. That's what's so pathetic about it all. Tim says he believes she drank. Is that true? Poirot nodded. Oh, well, poor woman. One mustn't judge her, I suppose, but the girl must have had a terrible life. She did, madame. She is very proud, and she was very loyal. Yes, I like that. Loyalty, I mean. It's out of fashion nowadays. She's an odd character, that girl. Proud, reserved, stubborn, and terribly warm-hearted underneath, I fancy. I see that I have given her into good hands, madame. Oh, yes, don't worry, I'll look after her. She's inclined to cling to me in the most pathetic fashion. Mrs. Allerton went back into the cabin. Poirot returned to the scene of the tragedy. Cornelia was still standing on the deck, her eyes wide. She said, I don't understand, Monsieur Poirot. How did the person who shot her get away without our seeing him? Yes, how? echoed Jacqueline. Ah, said Poirot, it was not quite such a disappearing trick as you think, mademoiselle. There were three distinct ways the murderer might have gone. Jacqueline looked puzzled. She said, three? Well, he, he might have gone to the right, or he might have gone to the left, but I don't see any other way, puzzled Cornelia. Jacqueline, too, frowned. Then her brow cleared. She said, oh, of course. He could move in two directions on one plane, but he could go at right angles to that plane, too. That is, he couldn't go up very well, but he could go down. Poirot smiled. You have brains, mademoiselle. Cornelia said, I know I'm just a plain mud, but I still don't see. Jacqueline said, Monsieur Poirot means, darling, that he could swing himself over the rail and down onto the deck below. My, gasped Cornelia, I never thought of that. He'd have to be mighty quick about it, though. I suppose he could just do it. Oh, he could do it easily enough, said Tim Allerton. Remember, there's always a minute of shock after a thing like this. One hears a shot, and one's too paralyzed to move for a second or two. That was your experience, Mr. Allerton? Oh, yes, it was. I just stood like a dummy for quite five seconds, and then I fairly sprinted round the deck. Race came out of Bessner's cabin and said authoritatively, Would you mind all clearing off? We want to bring out the body. Everyone moved away obediently. Poirot went with them. Cornelia said to him with sad earnestness, I'll never forget this trip as long as I live. Three deaths. It's just like living in a nightmare. Ferguson overheard her. He said aggressively, That's because you're over-civilized. You should look on death as the Oriental does. It's a mere incident, hardly noticeable. Cornelia said, Well, that's all very well. They're not educated, poor creatures. No, a good thing, too. Education has devitalized the white races. Look at America. Goes in for an orgy of culture. Simply disgusting. Well, I think you're talking nonsense, said Cornelia, flushing. I attend lectures every winter on Greek art, 
and the Renaissance, and I went to some on famous women of history. Mr. Ferguson groaned in agony. Oh, Greek art, Renaissance, famous women of history. Oh, God, it makes me quite sick to hear you. It's the future that matters, woman, not the past. Three women are dead on this boat. Eh? Well, what of it? They're no loss. Lynette Doyle and her money, the French maid, well, just a domestic parasite. Mrs. Otterborn, a useless fool of a woman. Do you think anyone really cares whether they're dead or not? I don't. I think it's a damn good thing. Then you're wrong, Cornelia blazed out at him. And it makes me sick to hear you talk and talk as though nobody mattered but you. I didn't like Mrs. Otterborn much, but her daughter was ever so fond of her, and she's all broken up over her mother's death. I don't know much about the French maid, but I expect somebody was fond of her somewhere. And as for Lynette Doyle, well, apart from everything else, she was just lovely. She was so beautiful when she came into a room that it made a lump come into your throat. I'm homely myself, and that makes me appreciate beauty a lot more. She was as beautiful, just as a woman, as anything in Greek art. And when anything beautiful's dead, it's a loss to the world. So there. Mr. Ferguson stepped back a pace. He caught hold of his hair with both hands and tugged at it vehemently. I give it up. He said, "You're unbelievable. You haven't got a bit of natural female spite in you anywhere." He turned to Poirot. "Do you know, sir, that Cornelia's father was practically ruined by Lynette Ridgeway's old man? But does the girl gnash her teeth when she sees the heiress sailing about in pearls and Paris models? No, she just bleats out, 'Isn't she beautiful?' Like a blessed bar lamb." I don't believe she even felt sore at her. Cornelia flushed. Well, I did, just for a minute. Papa kind of died of discouragement, you know, because he hadn't made good. Felt sore for a minute, I ask you. Cornelia flashed round on him. Well, didn't you say just now it was the future that mattered, not the past? All that was in the past, wasn't it? It's over. No,、oh, well, got me there," said Ferguson. Cornelia Robson, you're the only nice woman I've ever come across. Will you marry me? Don't be absurd. No, it's a genuine proposal, even if it is made in the presence of old man Sleuth. Anyway, you're a witness, Monsieur Poirot. I've deliberately offered marriage to this female against all my principles because I don't believe in legal contracts between the sexes. But <clears throat> I don't think she'd stand for anything else. So marriage it shall be. Come on, Cornelia, say yes. I think you're utterly ridiculous," said Cornelia, flushing. "But why won't you marry me? You're not serious," said Cornelia. "Well." Do you mean not serious in proposing, or do you mean not serious in character? Both, but I really meant character. You laugh at all sorts of serious things, education and culture and and death. You wouldn't be reliable. She broke off, flushed again, and hurried along into her cabin. Ferguson stared after her. Oh, damn the girl! I, I believe she really means it. She wants a man to be reliable, reliable. Ye gods! He paused and then said curiously, "But what's the matter with you, Monsieur Poirot? You seem very deep in thought." Poirot roused himself with a start. "I reflect. That is all. I reflect." Ah, meditation on death. Death, the recurring decimal by Hercule Poirot. One of his well-known monographs. Mister Ferguson," said Poirot, "you are a very impertinent young man. Now、uh, you must excuse me. I like attacking established institutions, and I am an established institution. Precisely. What do you think of that girl, of Miss Robson? Yes, I think she has a great deal of character. You're right. No, she's got spirit. She looks meek, but she isn't. She's got guts. She's, oh, damn it! I want that girl. It mightn't be a bad move if I tackled the old lady. If I could once get her thoroughly against me, it might cut some ice with Cornelia.
he wheeled round and went into the observation saloon. Miss Van Schuyler was seated in her usual corner. She looked even more arrogant than usual. She was knitting. Ferguson strode up to her. Hercule Poirot, entering unobtrusively, took a seat a discreet distance away and appeared to be absorbed in a magazine. Good afternoon, Miss Van Schuyler. Miss Van Schuyler raised her eyes for a bare second, dropped them again, and murmured frigidly, "Um, good afternoon." Look here, Miss Van Schuyler. I want to talk to you about something pretty important. It's just this: I want to marry your cousin. Miss Van Schuyler's ball of wool dropped onto the ground and ran wildly across the saloon. She said in a venomous tone, "You must be out of your senses, young man." Not at all. I'm determined to marry her. I've asked her to marry me. Miss Van Schuyler surveyed him coldly with the kind of speculative interest she might have accorded to an odd sort of beetle. Indeed, and I presume she sent you about your business. She refused me. Naturally, not naturally at all. I'm going to go on asking till she agrees. I can assure you, sir, I shall take steps to see that my young cousin is not subjected to any such persecution," said Miss Van Schuyler in a biting tone. "Well, what have you got against me?" Miss Van Schuyler merely raised her eyebrows and gave a vehement tug to her wool, preparatory to regaining it and closing the interval. "Oh, come now," persisted Mister Ferguson. "What have you got against me?" "I should think that was quite obvious, Mister.、Um, I don't know your name, Ferguson." Ah,、uh, Mister Ferguson," Miss Van Schuyler uttered the name with definite distaste. "Any such idea is quite out of the question." "You mean," said Ferguson, "that I'm not good enough for her?" "I should think that would have been obvious to you." "But in what way am I not good enough?" Miss Van Schuyler again did not answer. "I've got two legs, two arms, good health, and quite reasonable brains. What's wrong with that?" There is such a thing as social position, Mister Ferguson. Ah, social position is bunk. The door swung open and Cornelia came in. She stopped dead on seeing her redoubtable cousin Marie in conversation with her would-be suitor. The outrageous Mister Ferguson turned his head, grinned broadly, and called out, "Come on, Cornelia! I'm asking for your hand in marriage in the best conventional manner." Cornelia said, "Miss Van Schuyler," and her voice was truly awful in quality. "Have you encouraged this young man?" "I, no, of course not. At least, well, not exactly. I, I mean, what do you mean?" "Oh, <laughs> she hasn't encouraged me," said Mister Ferguson helpfully. "I've done it all. She hasn't actually pushed me in the face because she's got too kind a heart." Cornelia, your cousin says I'm not good enough for you. That, of course, is true, but not in the way she means it. My moral nature certainly doesn't equal yours. But her point is <laughs> that I'm hopelessly below you socially. Well, that I think is equally obvious to Cornelia," said Miss Van Schuyler. "Is it?" Mister Ferguson looked at her searchingly. "Is that why you won't marry me?" "No, it isn't." Cornelia flushed. "If." If I liked you, I'd marry you, no matter who you were. But you don't like me. I I think you're just outrageous. The way you say things, the things you say. I've I've never met anyone the least like you. I. <laughs> Tears threatened to overcome her. She rushed from the room. And on the whole, said Mister Ferguson, that's not too bad for a start. He leaned back in his chair, gazed at the ceiling, whistled. Crossed his disreputable knees and remarked, "I'll be calling you cousin yet." Miss Van Schuyler trembled with rage. "Leave this room at once, sir, or I'll ring for the steward." "I've paid for my ticket," said Mister Ferguson. "They can't possibly turn me out of the public lounge, but I'll humour you." He sang softly. Yo ho ho, and a bottle of rum. Rising, he sauntered nonchalantly to the door and passed out. Choking with anger, Miss Van Schuyler struggled to her feet. Poirot, 
discreetly emerging from retirement behind his magazine, sprang up and retrieved the ball of wool. Thank you, Monsieur Poirot. If you would send Miss Bowers to me, I, I feel quite upset. That insolent young man. Rather eccentric, I'm afraid, said Poirot. Most of that family are. Spoilt, of course, always inclined to tilt at windmills, he said carelessly. You recognized him, I suppose? Recognized him? Calls himself Ferguson and won't use his title because of his advanced ideas. His title? Miss Van Schuyler's tone was sharp. Oh, yes. That is young Lord Dawlish. Rolling in money, of course. But he became a communist when he was at Oxford. Miss Van Schuyler, her face a battleground of contradictory emotions, said, How long have you known this, Monsieur Poirot? Poirot shrugged his shoulders. There was a picture in one of these papers. I noticed a resemblance. Then I found a signet ring with a coat of arms on it. Oh, there's no doubt about it, I assure you. He quite enjoyed reading the conflicting expressions that succeeded each other on Miss Van Schuyler's face. Finally, with a gracious inclination of the head, she said, I'm very much obliged to you, Monsieur Poirot. Poirot looked after her as she went out of the saloon and smiled. Then he sat down, and his face grew grave once more. He was following out a train of thought in his mind. From time to time he nodded his head. May we? he said at last. It all fits in. Chapter 26 Race found him still sitting there. Well, Poirot, what about it? Pennington's due in ten minutes. I'm leaving this in your hands. Poirot rose quickly to his feet. First, get hold of young Fanthorpe. Fanthorpe? Race looked surprised. Yes, bring him to my cabin. Race nodded and went off. Poirot went along to his cabin. Race arrived with young Fanthorpe a minute or two afterwards. Poirot indicated chairs and offered cigarettes. Now, Monsieur Fanthorpe, he said, to our business. I perceive that you wear the same tie that my friend Hastings wears. Jim Fanthorpe looked down at his neckwear with some bewilderment. It's an O.E. tie, he said. Exactly. You must understand that though I am a foreigner, I know something of the English point of view. I know, for instance, that there are things which are done and things which are not done. Jim Fanthorpe grinned. We don't say that sort of thing much nowadays, sir. Perhaps not, but the custom, it still remains. The old school tie is the old school tie, and there are certain things, I know this from experience, that the old school tie does not do. One of those things, Monsieur Fanthorpe, is to butt into a private conversation and ask when one does not know the people who are conducting it. Fanthorpe stared. Poirot went on. But the other day, Monsieur Fanthorpe, that is exactly what you did do. Certain persons were quietly transacting some private business in the observation saloon. You strolled near them, obviously in order to overhear what it was that was in progress. And presently you actually turned round and congratulated a lady, Mrs. Simon Doyle, on the soundness of her business methods. Jim Fanthorpe's face got very red. Poirot swept on, not waiting for a comment. Now that, Monsieur Fanthorpe, was not at all the behavior of one who wears a tie similar to that worn by my friend Hastings. Hastings is all delicacy, would die of shame before he did such a thing. Therefore, taking that action of yours in conjunction with the fact that you are a very young man to be able to afford an expensive holiday, that you are a member of a country solicitor's firm, and therefore probably not extravagantly well off, and that you show no sign of recent illness, such as might necessitate a prolonged visit abroad, I ask myself, and I am now asking you, what is our reason for your presence on this boat? Jim Fanthorpe jerked his head back. I d decline to give you any information whatever, Monsieur Poirot. I, I really think you must be mad. 
No, I am not mad. I am very, very sane. Where is your firm? In Northampton? That is not very far from World Hall. What conversation did you try to overhear? One concerning legal documents. What was the object of your remark? A remark which you uttered with obvious embarrassment and malaise? Your object was to prevent Mrs. Doyle from signing any documents on red. He paused. On this boat we have had a murder, and following that murder, two other murders in rapid succession. If I further give you the information that the weapon which killed Mrs. Otterborn was a revolver owned by Mr. Andrew Pennington, then perhaps you will realize that it is exactly your duty to tell us all you can. Jim Fanthorpe was silent for some minutes. At last, he said, You have rather an odd way of going about things, Monsieur Poirot, but I appreciate the points you have made. The trouble is that I have no exact information to lay before you. You mean that it is a case merely of suspicion? Yes. And therefore you think it injudicious to speak? That may be true, legally speaking, but this is not a court of law. Colonel Race and myself are endeavouring to track down a murderer. Anything that can help us to do so may be valuable. Again, Jim Fanthorpe reflected. Then he said, Very well. What is it you want to know? Why did you come on this trip? My uncle, Mr. Carmichael, Mrs. Doyle's English solicitor, sent me. He handled a good many of her affairs. In this way, he was often in correspondence with Mr. Andrew Pennington, who was Mrs. Doyle's American trustee. Several small incidents, I cannot enumerate them all, made my uncle suspicious that all was not quite as it should be. In plain language, said Race, your uncle suspected that Pennington was a crook? Jim Fanthorpe nodded, a faint smile on his face. <laughs> you put it rather more bluntly than I should, but the main idea is correct. Various excuses made by Pennington, certain plausible explanations of the disposals of his were still nebulous. Miss Ridgway married unexpectedly and went off on her honeymoon to Egypt. Her marriage relieved my uncle's mind as he knew that on her return to England the estate would have to be formally settled and handed over. However, in a letter she wrote him from Cairo, she mentioned casually that she had unexpectedly run across Andrew Pennington. My uncle's suspicions became acute. He felt sure that Pennington, perhaps by now in a desperate position, was going to try and obtain signatures from her which would cover his own defalcations. Since my uncle had no definite evidence to lay before her, he was in a most difficult position. The only thing he could think of was to send me out here, travelling by air, with instructions to discover what was in the wind. I was to keep my eyes open and act summarily if necessary. A most unpleasant mission, I can assure you. As a matter of fact, on the occasion you mention, I had to behave more or less as a cad. It was awkward, but on the whole I was satisfied with the result. You mean you put Mrs. Doyle on her guard? asked Race. No, not so much that. But I think I put the wind up Pennington. I felt convinced he wouldn't try any more funny business for some time, and by then I hoped to have got intimate enough with Mr. and Mrs. Doyle to convey some kind of a warning. As a matter of fact, I hoped to do so through Doyle. Mrs. Doyle was so attached to Mr. Pennington that it would have been a bit awkward to suggest things to her about him. It would have been easier for me to approach the husband. Race nodded. Poirot asked, Will you give me a candid opinion on one point, Monsieur Fanthorpe? If you were engaged in putting a swindle over, would you choose Mrs. Doyle or Mr. Doyle as a victim? Fanthorpe smiled faintly. Ah, Mr. Doyle, every time. Lynette Doyle was very shrewd in business matters. Her husband, I should fancy, is one of those trustful fellows who know nothing of business and are always ready to sign on the dotted line, as he himself put it. I agree, said Poirot. He looked at Race. And there's your motive. Jim Fanthorpe said, But this is all pure conjecture. It isn't evidence. Poirot said easily, Ah, bah, we will get evidence. How? Possibly from Mr. Pennington himself. Fanthorpe looked doubtful. I wonder, I very much wonder. 
Race glanced at his watch. He's about due now. Jim Fanthorpe was quick to take the hint. He left them. Two minutes later, Andrew Pennington made his appearance. His manner was all smiling urbanity. Only the taut line of his jaw and the wariness of his eyes betrayed the fact that a thoroughly experienced fighter was on his guard. Well, gentlemen, he said, here I am. He sat down and looked at them inquiringly. We asked you to come here, Mr. Pennington, began Poirot, because it is fairly obvious that you have a very special and immediate interest in the case. Pennington raised his eyebrows slightly. Is that so? Poirot said gently, Oh, surely? You have known Lynette Ridgway, I understand, since she was quite a child. Oh, that! His face altered, became less alert. I beg pardon, I, I didn't quite get you. Ah, uh, yes, as I told you this morning, I have known Lynette since she was a cute little thing in pinafores. <laughs> you are in terms of close intimacy with her father? Ah, uh, that's so. Mullowish Ridgway and I were very close, very, very close. You were so intimately associated that on his death he appointed you, business guardian, to his daughter and trustee to the vast fortune she inherited. Why, roughly, yes, that is so. The wariness was back again. The note was more cautious. I was not the only trustee, naturally. Others were associated with me. Who have since died? Well, uh, two of them are dead. The other, Mr. Sterndale Rockford, is alive. Your partner? Yes. Miss Ridgway, I understand, was not yet of age when she married. Uh, she would have been twenty-one next July. And in the normal course of events, she would have come into control of her fortune then? Yes. But her marriage precipitated matters? Pennington's jaw hardened. He shot out his chin at them aggressively. You'll pardon me, gentlemen, but what exact business is all this of yours? If you dislike answering the question... No, look, there's no dislike about it. I, I, I don't mind what you ask me, but I don't see the relevance of all this. Oh, but surely, Mr. Pennington, Poirot leaned forward, his eyes green and cat-like. There is the question of motive. In considering that, financial considerations must always be taken into account. Pennington said sullenly, By Ridgway's will, Lynette got control of her dough when she was twenty-one or when she married. No conditions of any kind? No conditions. And it is a matter, I am credibly assured, of millions? Millions it is. Poirot said softly, Your responsibility, Monsieur Pennington, and that of your partner has been a very grave one. Pennington said curtly, We're used to our responsibility. It doesn't worry us any. I wonder. Something in his tone flicked the other man on the roar. He said angrily, What the devil do you mean? Poirot replied with an air of engaging frankness. I was wondering, Mr. Pennington, whether Lynette Ridgway's sudden marriage caused any consternation in your office. Consternation? That was the word I used. Well, what the hell are you driving at? Something quite simple. Are Lynette Doyle's affairs in the perfect order they should be? Pennington rose to his feet. That's enough. I'm through. He made for the door. But you will answer my question first. Pennington snapped. They're in perfect order. Hmm. You were not so alarmed when the news of Lynette Ridgway's marriage reached you that you rushed over to Europe by the first boat and staged an apparently fortuitous meeting in Egypt? Pennington came back towards them. He had himself under control once more. What you are saying is absolute balderdash. I didn't even know that Lynette was married till I met her in Cairo. I was utterly astonished. Her letter must have missed me by a day in New York. It was forwarded, and I got it about a week later. You came over by the Kavanik, I think you said. That's right. And the letter reached New York after the Kavanik sailed? How many times have I got to repeat it? It is strange, said Poirot. What strange? That on your luggage there are no labels of the Kavanik. The only recent labels of transatlantic sailing are the Normandy. The Normandy, I remember, 
sailed two days after the Kamanik. For a moment, the other was at a loss. His eyes wavered. Colonel Race weighed in with telling effect. Calm now, Mr. Pennington, he said. We have several reasons for believing that you came over on the Normandy and not by the Carmenic, as you said. In that case, you received Mrs. Doyle's letter before you left New York. No good denying it, but it's the easiest thing in the world to check up the steamship companies. Andrew Pennington felt absent-mindedly for a chair and sat down. His face was impassive, a poker face. Behind that mask, his agile brain looked ahead to the next move. I'll have to hand it to you, gentlemen. You've been too smart for me. But I had my reasons for acting as I did. No doubt. Race's tone was curt. If I give them to you, it must be understood. I do so in confidence. I think you can trust us to behave fittingly. Naturally, I cannot give assurances blindly. Well, Pennington sighed. I'll come clean. There was some monkey business going on in England. It worried me. I couldn't do much about it by letter. The only thing was to come over and see for myself. What do you mean by monkey business? I had good reason to believe that Lynette was being swindled. By whom? Her British lawyer. Now, that's not the kind of accusation you can fling around anyhow. I made up my mind to come over right away and see it matters myself. That does great credit to your vigilance, I'm sure. But why the little deception about not having received the letter? Well, I ask you, Pennington spread out his hands. You can't butt in on a honeymoon couple without more or less coming down to brass tacks and giving your reasons. I thought it best to make the meeting, well, accidental. Besides, I didn't know anything about the husband. He might have been mixed up in the racket for all I knew. In fact, all your actions were actuated by pure disinterestedness, said Colonel Race dryly. You've said it, Colonel. There was a pause. Race glanced at Poirot. The little man leant forward. Monsieur Pennington, we do not believe a word of your story. The hell you don't! Well, what the hell do you believe? We believe that Lynette Ridgway's unexpected marriage put you in a financial quandary, that you came over post-haste to try and find some way out of the mess you are in, that is to say, some way of gaining time, that, with that end in view, you endeavoured to obtain Mrs. Doyle's signature to certain documents and failed, that, on the journey up the Nile, when walking along the cliff top at Abu Simbel, you dislodged a boulder which fell and only very narrowly missed its object. You're crazy! We believe that the same kind of circumstances occurred on the return journey. That is to say, an opportunity presented itself for putting Mrs. Doyle out of the way at the moment when her death would be almost certainly ascribed to the action of another person. We not only believe, but know that it was your revolver which killed a woman who was about to reveal to us the name of the person whom she had reason to believe killed both Lynette Doyle and the maid Louise. Hell! The forced ejaculation broke forth and interrupted Poirot's stream of eloquence. What are you getting at? Are you crazy? What motive had I to kill Lynette? I wouldn't get her money. That goes to her husband. Why don't you pick on him? He's the one to benefit, not me! Race said coldly, Doyle never left the lounge on the night of the tragedy till he was shot at and wounded in the leg. The impossibility of his walking a step after that is attested to by a doctor and a nurse, both independent and reliable witnesses. Simon Doyle could not have killed his wife. He could not have killed Louise Bourget. He most definitely did not kill Mrs. Otterbourne. You know that as well as we do. I know he didn't kill her. Pennington sounded a little calmer. All I say is, why pick on me when I don't benefit by her death? But, my dear sir... Poirot's voice came soft as a purring cat. That is rather a matter of opinion. Mrs. Doyle was a keen woman of business, fully conversant of her own affairs, and very quick to spot any irregularity. 
as soon as she took up the control of her property, which she would have done on her return to England, her suspicions were bound to be aroused. But now that she is dead, and that her husband, as you have just pointed out, inherits, the whole thing is different. Simon Doyle knows nothing whatever of his wife's affairs, except that she was a rich woman. He is of a simple, trusting disposition. You will find it easy to place complicated statements before him, to involve the real issue in a net of figures, and to delay settlement with pleas of legal formalities and a recent depression. I think that it makes a very considerable difference to you whether you deal with the husband or the wife. Pennington shrugged his shoulders. Your ideas are fantastic. Time will show. What did you say? I said, time will show. This is a matter of three deaths, three murders. The law will demand the most such investigation into the condition of Mrs. Doyle's estate. He saw the sudden sag in the other's shoulders and knew that he had won. Jim Fanthorpe's suspicions were well founded. Poirot went on. You have played and lost. Useless to go and bluffing. Pennington muttered, You don't understand. It's all square enough, really. It's been this damn slump. Wall Street's been crazy. But I'd staged a comeback. With luck, everything will be okay by the middle of June. With shaking hands, he took a cigarette, tried to light it, failed. I suppose, mused Poirot, that the boulder was a sudden temptation, huh? You thought nobody saw you. No, look, that was an accident. I, I swear it was an accident. The man leaned forward, his face working, his eyes terrified. I stumbled and fell against it. I swear it was an accident. The two men said nothing. Pennington suddenly pulled himself together. He was still a wreck of a man, but his fighting spirit had returned in a certain measure. He moved towards the door. You can't pin that on me, gentlemen. It was an accident, and it wasn't I who shot her, do you hear? You can't pin that on me either. And you never will. He went out. Chapter 27 As the door closed behind him, Race gave a deep sigh. Ah, we got more than I thought we would. Admission of a fraud. Mm, admission of attempted murder. Further than that, it's impossible to go. A man will confess, more or less, to attempted murder, but you won't get him to confess to the real thing. Sometimes he can be done, said Poirot. His eyes were dreamy, cat-like. Race looked at him curiously. Got a plan? Poirot nodded. Then he said, ticking off the items on his fingers. The garden at Aswan. Mr. Allerton Stedman. The two bottles of nail polish. My bottle of wine. The velvet stole. The stained handkerchief. The pistol that was left on the scene of the crime. The death of Louise. The death of Mrs. Ottobon. Yes. It's all there. Pennington didn't do it, Race. What? Race was startled. No, Pennington didn't do it. He had the motive, yes. He had the will to do it, yes. He got as far as attempting to do it. Mais c'est tout. Something was wanted for this crime that Pennington hasn't got. This is a crime that needed audacity, swift and faultless execution, courage, indifference to danger, and a resourceful, calculating brain. Pennington hasn't got those attributes. He couldn't do a crime unless he knew it to be safe. This crime was not safe. It hung on a razor edge. It needed a boldness. Pennington isn't bold. He's only astute. Race looked at him with the respect one able man gives to another. Ah, you've got it all well taped, he said. I think so, yes. There are one or two things... That telegram, for instance, that Lynette Doyle read, I should like to get that cleared up. Well, by Jove, we've got to ask Doyle. He was telling us when poor old Ma Otterborn came along. We'll ask him again. No, presently. First, I have someone else to whom I wish to speak. Who's that? Tim Allerton. Race raised his eyebrows. Allerton? Well, we'll get him here. He pressed a bell and sent the steward with a message. Tim Allerton entered with a questioning look. Steward said you wanted to see me. 
Uh, that's right, Mr. Allerton, sit down. Tim sat. His face was attentive, but very slightly bored. Anything I can do? His tone was polite, but not enthusiastic. Poirot said, In a sense, perhaps. What I really require is for you to listen. Tim's eyebrows rose in polite surprise. Oh, certainly. I'm the world's best listener. Can be relied upon to say ooh-er at the right moment. That is very satisfactory. Ooh-er will be very expressive. Eh bien, let us commence. When I met you and your mother at Assouin, Monsieur Allerton, I was attracted to your company very strongly. To begin with, I thought your mother was one of the most charming people I had ever met. The weary face flickered for a moment. A shade of expression came into it. <laughs> she is unique, he said. But the second thing that interested me was your mention of a certain lady. Really? Yes. A Miss Joanna Southwood. You see, I had recently been hearing that name. He paused and went on. For the last three years, there have been certain jewel robberies that have been worrying Scotland Yard a good deal. They are what may be described as society robberies. The method is usually the same. The substitution of an imitation piece of jewellery for an original. My friend, Chief Inspector Jap, came to the conclusion that the robberies were not the work of one person, but of two people working in with each other very cleverly. He was convinced, from the considerable inside knowledge displayed, that the robberies were the work of people in good social position. And finally, his attention became riveted on Miss Joanna Southwood. Every one of the victims had been either a friend or acquaintance of hers, and in each case she had either handled or been lent the piece of jewellery in question. Also, her style of living was far in excess of her income. On the other hand, it was quite clear that the actual robbery, that is to say the substitution, had not been accomplished by her. In some cases, she had even been out of England during the period when the jewellery must have been replaced. So gradually, a little picture grew up in Chief Inspector Japp's mind. Miss Southwood was at one time associated with the Guild of Modern Jewellery. He suspected that she handled the jewels in question, made accurate drawings of them, got them copied by some humble but dishonest working jeweller, and that the third part of the operation was a successful substitution by another person, somebody who could have been proved never to have handled the jewels and never to have had anything to do with copies or imitations of precious stones. Of the identity of this other person, Jap was ignorant. Now, certain things that fell from you in conversation interested me. A ring that had disappeared when you were in Mallorca. The fact that you had been in a house party where one of these fake substitutions had occurred. Your close association with Miss Southwood. There was also the fact that you obviously resented my presence and tried to get your mother to be less friendly towards me. That might, of course, have been just personal dislike, but I thought not. You were too anxious to try and hide your distaste under a genial manner. Eh bien. After the murder of Lynette Doyle, it is discovered that her pearls are missing. You comprehend at once, I think, of you. But I am not quite satisfied. For if you are working as I suspect with Miss Southwood, who was an intimate friend of Mrs. Doyle's, then substitution would be the method employed, not barefaced theft. But then the pearls quite unexpectedly are returned. And what do I discover? That they are not genuine, but imitation. I know then who the real thief is. It was the imitation string which was stolen and returned, an imitation which you had previously substituted for the real necklace. He looked at the young man in front of him. Tim was white under his tan. He was not so good a fighter as Pennington. His stamina was bad. He said with an effort to sustain his mocking manner, oh, Indeed? And if so... What did I do with them? That I also know. The young man's face changed, broke up. Poirot went on slowly. 
There is only one place where they can be. I have reflected, and my reason tells me that that is so. Those pearls, Mr. Allerton, are concealed in a rosary that hangs in your cabin. The beads of it are very elaborately carved. I think you had it made specially. Those beads unscrew, though you would never think so to look at them. Inside each is a pearl stuck with secotin. Most police searchers respect religious symbols unless there is something obviously queer about them, and you counted on that. I endeavor to find out how Miss Southwood sent the imitation necklace out to you. She must have done so, since you came here from Mallorca and hearing that Mrs. Doyle would be here for her honeymoon. My theory is that it was sent in a book, a square hole being cut out of the pages in the middle. A book goes with the ends open, and is practically never opened in the post. There was a pause, a long pause. Then Tim said quietly, "You win. <laughs> it's been a good game, but it's over at last. There's nothing for it now, I suppose, but to take my medicine." Poirot nodded gently. "Do you realize that you were seen that night?" Seen. Tim started. Yes, on the night that Lynette Doyle died, someone saw you leave her cabin just after one in the morning. Tim said, "Look here, you aren't thinking that it, it wasn't I who killed her. I'll swear that. I've been in the most awful stew. To have chosen that night of all others, oh God, it's been awful." Poirot said, "Oh yes." You must have had uneasy moments, but now that the truth has come out, you may be able to help us. Was Mrs. Doyle alive or dead when you stole the pearls? Tim said hoarsely, "I, I don't know. Honest to God, Mr. Poirot, I don't know. I'd found out where she put them at night, on the little table by the bed. I crept in, felt very softly on the table, grabbed them, put down the others, and crept out again. I assumed, of course, that she was asleep." Did you hear her breathing? Surely you would have listened for that. Tim thought earnestly. Oh, it was very still, very still indeed. No, I, I can't remember actually hearing her breathe. Was there any smell of smoke lingering in the air, as there would have been if a firearm had been discharged recently? I don't think so. I, I don't remember it. Poirot sighed. Ah,、oh, then we are no further. Tim asked curiously, "Who was it saw me?" Rosalie Otterbourn. She came round from the other side of the boat and saw you leave Lynette Doris' cabin and go to your own. So it was she who told you. Poirot said gently, "Excuse me, she did not tell me." But then, well, how do you know? Because I am Hercule Poirot. I do not need to be told. When I taxed her with it, do you know what she said? She said, "I saw nobody," and she lied. But why? Poirot said in a detached voice. Perhaps because she thought that the man she saw was the murderer. It looked like that, you know. Well, that seems to me all the more reason for telling you. Poirot shrugged his shoulders. She did not think so. It seems. Tim said, a queer note in his voice. She's an extraordinary sort of a girl. She must have been through a pretty rough time with that mother of hers. Oh yes, life has not been easy for her. Poor kid. Tim muttered. Then he looked towards Race. Well, sir, where do we go from here? I admit taking the pearls from Lynette's cabin, and you'll find them just where you say they are. I'm guilty, all right, but as far as Miss Southwood is concerned, I'm not admitting anything. You've no evidence whatever against her. How I got hold of the fake necklace is my own business. Poirot murmured,、hmm, "A very correct attitude." Tim said with a flash of humour, "Always the gentleman." He added, "But perhaps you can imagine how annoying it was to me to find my mother cottoning on to you." I'm not a sufficiently hardened criminal to enjoy sitting cheek by jowl with a successful detective just before bringing off a rather risky coup. Some people might get a kick out of it. I didn't. Frankly, it gave me cold feet. 
But he did not deter you from making your attempt. Tim shrugged his shoulders. Well, I couldn't funk it to that extent. The exchange had to be made some time, and I'd got a unique opportunity on this boat. A cabin only two doors off, and Lynette herself so preoccupied with her own troubles that she wasn't likely to take the change. I wonder if that was so. Tim looked up sharply. What do you mean? Poirot pressed the bell. I am going to ask Miss Otterborn if she will come here for a minute. Tim frowned, but said nothing. A steward came, received the order, and went away with the message. Rosalie came after a few minutes. Her eyes reddened with recent weeping, widened a little at seeing Tim, but her old attitude of suspicion and defiance seemed entirely absent. She sat down and, with a new docility, looked from Race to Poirot. Uh, "We're very sorry to bother you, Miss Otterborn," said Race gently. He was slightly annoyed with Poirot. The girl said in a low voice, "It doesn't matter." Poirot said, "It is necessary to clear up one or two points. When I asked you whether you saw anyone on the starboard deck at one ten this morning, your answer was that you saw nobody. Fortunately, I have been able to arrive at the truth without your help. Mister Allerton has admitted that he was in Leonard Doyle's cabin last night." She flashed a swift glance at Tim. Tim, his face grim and set, gave a curt nod. The time is correct, Mister Allerton. Allerton replied, "Quite correct." Rosalie was staring at him. Her lips trembled, and fell apart. But you didn't. You didn't. He said quickly, "No, I didn't kill her." I am a thief, not a murderer. It's all going to come out, so you might as well know. I was after her pearls. Poirot said, "Mr. Allerton's story is that he went to a cabin last night and exchanged a string of fake pearls for the real ones." Did you? Said Rosalie. Her eyes, grave, sad, childlike, questioned his. Yes, said Tim. There was a pause. Colonel Race shifted restlessly. Poirot said in a curious voice, "That, as I say, is Mister Allerton's story, partially confirmed by your evidence. That is to say, there is evidence that he did visit Lynette Doyle's cabin last night, but there is no evidence to show why he did so." Tim stared at him. "But you know, what do I know? Well, you know, I've got the pearls." Oh, mais oui, mais oui. I know you have the pearls, but I do not know when you got them. It may have been before last night. You said just now that Lynette Doyle would not have noticed the substitution. I'm not so sure of that. Supposing she did notice it. Supposing even she knew who did it. Supposing the last night she threatened to expose the whole business, and that you knew she meant to do so. And supposing that you overheard the scene in the saloon between Jacqueline de Belfort and Simon Doyle, and as soon as the saloon was empty, you slipped in and secured the pistol, and then an hour later, when the boat had quieted down, you crept along to Lynette Doyle's cabin and made quite sure that no exposure would come. My God," said Tim. Out of his ashen face, two tortured, agonized eyes gazed dumbly at Hercule Poirot. 